right, Noontide Side Attic Drifter. I think this is technically the fastest I've dropped one of these commentary videos after its release. Last time I wanted to wait a while and get a feel for what the critical response might be. And this time we're dealing with an album that dropped in early December in the shadow of a different release from a much bigger band. The chances of this getting wider coverage were pretty much zero. <laughs> but honestly, I didn't care as much about what other people thought this time around either. It still took a bit for this video to come out because I kept getting distracted by other stuff. Fitting for this album subject matter, but yeah. Anyway, I kind of already knew the direction I wanted to go in for this thing while making 04, and the response to it only further cemented that was what I wanted to do. What with a common point of criticism for that album being its lack of texture or interesting ideas compared to previous albums. And yeah, that was obviously something I fully set out to address with this project because I knew for a fact I could do it. This album may mostly be stuff I've done before to some extent. In a lot of ways, it was me returning to my comfort zone of loop-based material, but I also see this as the payoff of my last three albums feeling more like learning experiences. Me trying to focus in on their weaknesses and fulfill the potential they didn't pull off. I looked back at If Tomorrow Is A Ball, I thought, this album is still much too long-winded and scattershot, and I still consider it one of my weakest projects. But I've always thought there was something there that could have been amazing and I didn't quite capture. I mean, if one major opinion has shifted since I did the commentary on that album, like, I used to be embarrassed by the ridiculous overlong album and song titling, but now I look back on it and wish the music itself had actually leaned into it more. Now my problem's more that it could have been so much goofier than it actually was. And obviously that informed my decision to make this album my goofiest and weirdest to date, with lots of even more lo overlong and ridiculous song titles. I looked back at Spiral Out of Control, that's an album that has honestly been shrinking on me quite a bit in recent years. I think its second half is a lot weaker than the first, uh, it's not as texturally interesting as some of my other stuff. The old FL Studio cuts are pretty basic and still feel like I'm making baby steps out of my old loop-based ways. And I, I like hyper-focused in on making the full album experience as cohesive as I possibly could and justifying the double album layout, perhaps at the expense of the individual tracks all being as strong as they possibly could be. Also, that's an album that needs a very specific mood for me to best get into, the kind of thing designed for, like, walking around the city at night which is not something I've really had the chance to do in a long time, thanks to the pandemic. But I'll tell you what, I still remember that album being really fun to make. Being a mix of material I'd had public on 256 by Music, some random archive material, and even some new material created specifically for the album, and how beyond hyped I was when the whole thing was finished and out there in the world despite mostly coming together over a period of a few months, not including waiting for collabs. So I made this album using the same methods as Spiral, because that was the most fun I had putting a new album of mine together. A healthy mix of FL Studio and Acid Music Studio, trying to make the best out of both program strengths and weaknesses that I had a lot more of a grasp on than I did before, including both material that I was releasing in public sessions and material I was just coming up with on the side specifically for the album proper. Also from Spiral, I knew the upper bound for me and album lengths. As someone who's used to listening to a lot of 90s electronic outfits, what I perceive to be the most satisfying album length probably feels a little skewed for most people. Like, most of my all-time favorite albums are from the CD era and run on for a good 60-70 minutes. I remember being legit surprised when I first heard that, for instance, Outicurs in Cunabula was an album that some people considered to be too long. That always felt perfectly reasonable and normal to me. So that's typically how I aim for my own albums to end up lengthwise, to fit on one CD. So that's the length I wanted this project to sit around as well. But I also kept in mind that I absolutely should not do what I did with earlier albums like Dark Clouds and let tracks just run on and on for ages and overextend them. I knew that most people prefer shorter 40-50 minute projects, and if I'm gonna have a 70 minute one, then it's gotta make as good use of that length as I possibly can. And then, of course, I also looked back on 044444 itself. That was an album that aimed to fix a lot of running issues I had with my old projects and intentionally put myself out of my comfort zone. But it also put me in, like, this terrible, insecure, demotivating headspace and wasn't nearly as fun to make as I hoped it could be. With me attempting to write lyrics, which is already contrary to how my brain works and super difficult for me on my own, on top of my using them to explore what I saw to be my personal failings as a person, 
grappling with my trying to fit into society as much as I felt pressured to but not succeeding, being frustrated with how I was having such a hard time doing what those around me were accomplishing so easily, constantly shaming myself for it on top of that. I mean, again, I'm still glad I did it in the end, especially for the learning experience, and I can still listen back to that album without cringing and think it's pretty solid for what it is. I'm proud I got through it and got it out there. But I do look back on it and think this felt like kind of an unhealthy and unnatural way for me to go about things. It was like me trying to force myself to be a normal person in a way that I really wasn't. So that in turn led me to sort of re-exploring the idea behind the album and turning this one into a loose concept about my having ADHD. Right down to the album title and interlude track titles being anagrams of Attention Deficit Disorder. While I was making this album, I started to follow, like, a few ADHD comic accounts on Twitter and uh, look into what my ADHD actually entailed a lot more than I used to, and getting more of a solid understanding of it informed a lot of decisions on this album, including how intentionally, stylistically scattershot it was a la Orbitals the All Together. Figured it was only fitting to not focus on any one side of my style in particular on this album exploring this unignorable, incurable condition I've lived with my entire life that prevents me from having any control over what I can focus my energy on at any given moment and often leads to my mind wandering all over the place. I mean, I briefly touched on this kind of stuff in 04, but mostly just buried it in self-loathing and wrote it off as, oh, it's no excuse, I must just suck as a person. But I kind of figured out that ADHD might actually be entirely to blame for all that behavior I was so frustrated with on that album. I figured out that, no, this is a legit, like, disability that affects lots of people whether they were diagnosed with it early on in life like I was or not. So I treated this album as a sort of do-over for exploring those themes in a way that actually fit for the kind of person I am. And at the same time, just as 04 was kind of a reaction to 2018, quite possibly being the worst year of my life when I felt like I got nothing done at all, this album was also a reaction to 2020 and what it felt like to live through that year. And you know, 2020, I I'm not gonna lie and say it was the worst year of my life. It wasn't. But it was an excessively weird and crazy year to live through. To which an overlong 70 minute album that shoots all over the place stylistically feels like it could fit for. That's why I still wanted it to come out in December of 2020. And I also wanted it to come out before the Avalanche's new album since I wanted that to be the last big album experience I got in that year. Which very much set myself up to get completely buried and pass under everyone's radar in an easily preventable way, but oh well. <laughs> so then, how about we talk about individual tracks? To start with, uh, one thing that I kinda noticed as a pattern on pretty much all my previous albums is that they all have a slow start. I wanted to break that trend and start an album that, like, just immediately punches you in the face and I knew exactly what track was gonna get me there. Like, a few months after 04, I had put together a five-track session of music called You Nork to See to get myself re-motivated in my old loop-based methods, which was kind of an awkward mix of rock and jazz and electronic that didn't really come together, but it did have one track I thought was legit great called Stempire Pate. Like, that track was super fast-paced and chaotic. It didn't sound like anything else in my previous catalog either with its mix of hyper-speed drum and bass and New Orleans E horn sections that all work together surprisingly well. And even though it was the second track of that session, everything about it just read to me as, this needs to be the album opener. There was the trouble in that I'd called it Stampire Pate, a failed attempt at a spoonerism of Empire State. <laughs> So that became the subtitle of the track, with the main title becoming The Cylindrical Discharge. Get it? Because we're starting firing on all cylinders. A bad title made even more odd and unwieldy and goofy. That, that That's perfect, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So I combined this track with like some elements of the only other track on that session I saw potential in, uh, Sand Grinchel Tastion. Ugh. And of course, since I was really trying to go against that trend of my album starting too low-key, I came up with that whole intro section, starting off with that sample of Wilford Brimley saying, Good morning, followed by the gigantic burst of chaotic noise. Sort of getting the stick out of my ass with that genre, I guess. Oh yeah, and to make the mix even more crazy and chaotic, I then added a bunch of Mimi vocal samples chopped up into little pieces such as this one. Good evening, I'm Ken Bastida. Dana is off tonight. He was murdered and then set on fire while celebrating his birthday. I think you can guess why I thought this might fit well incorporated into a track like this. 
And honestly, I think I freaking nailed this opener. Even if it's not really indicative of what the full album experience is like, it's just pure sensory overload and anxiety, and doing everything it can to be crazy and attention-grabbing, and kind of summed up what it felt like to live in 2020, watching world-shifting headline after world-shifting headline nearly every day and losing your grip on sanity. And from there, I got the idea for the interludes while coming up with anagrams for attention deficit disorder to name the album after. Since one of them turned up as Frenetic Detroit Editions, I thought of turning that title into a sort of extension of Cylindrical Discharge that was retooled to sound like old-school Detroit techno. That was too good an idea for me to pass up, and while I don't think any of the other interludes had as cool an idea behind them, they ended up becoming like a sort of recurring device to make the album feel more like a holistic experience. So I'd written up a bunch of passages to be read out by text-to-speech voices, looked for the voice setting that would, uh, least make them seem like a joke, maybe stutter and glitch them a bit, mess with the panning to fit with the more abstract nature of the rest of the album, and of course all of these passages are semi-oblique descriptions of my ADHD experience. Sort of through the lens of, uh, feeling like my brain is in zero gravity and can either not have any direction or hyperfixate on one thing with no in-between and no real control over when I can or can't focus my energy on something. I do get a little less enjoyment out of the interludes the further into I go into the album, but all of them mean at least something to me. Tired Indicted Forestation sort of concerns my lack of control on what I can focus on, and how hyperfixating can make me entirely lose track of time. Hence how that track leads into an unspecified interval of time, and that track symbolizing the same concept. But to fit with that interlude's actual title, I had that intro of the forest sound effects, and that cool echoing synth bass, just thought that sounded neat. Definite addiction retorts concerned how neurotypical people can see neurodivergent people as not fitting into society, and my own experience of always assuming and being told that all my problems are my own fault and within my own power to solve, despite that not always being true. And tidiest interaction fodder concerns how ADHD might also be partially to blame for my extreme social anxiety and needing to be away from other people all the time. Limit my interactions as it were. And of course, there's also the extra passage in the closer, The Spherical Discharge, concerning how I can find comfort in knowing, hey, there are actually way more people who have the same sorts of problems I do, might be able to relate and understand me, even if my experience isn't going to 100% match up with everyone else. I'm, I'm never truly alone. And I thought that was a good sentiment to leave the album off on. Now, as I mentioned, not every track on the album directly ties into my experience with ADHD. It is only a loose concept and a deliberately unfocused one, since I'm not all that great at focusing. <laughs> but it does tie into the regular non-interlude tracks sometimes, most notably Selected Subtractions 8592 which I thought up the idea to include these Kraftwerk-style voices listing off symptoms of ADHD and things that get subtracted from my life as a result of it. Though that was an idea that I didn't implement there until, like, later on. Like, that track was originally just intended as a retooling and tightening up of a 15-minute mini-suite called Subtractions that I did for a 256 Pi Music session called The Subtractions of the Incompetent Skater. Uh, the original session it came from was not good. Uh, it's basically, it was basically just a collection of random leftover ideas I had. But the actual subtraction suite was obviously the most high effort thing I did in that session. I thought it had a lot of potential if I cut it down and just selected the best segments from it. Hence turning the title into a corny Apex Twin reference. But I do legit think the final result was one of the best parts of the album. Like I did fully bring out all the potential the original cut had and made it even more fun and sounding significantly better than it used to. The bass line and groove was stronger, the production was better detailed, none of it felt like aimless meandering. Even the key changes at the end were pretty epic, even if they were just being used as a device to better transition into the next track. Aluminum Sunset Delay of the 13th Frontier is a mouthful of a title, but that's also a retooling of a track from a 256 Pi Music session that I saw a lot of potential in. On the Trilogy of Error session, I had a, this multi-part track called Aluminum Sun, which had this really cool, like, Ultimate Record-style ambient build-up I really liked and then a different part I really liked because of this catchy loop of piano chords. So I turned the former of those sections into the track's intro, and the latter part got retooled in something that sounded funkier, I guess. More resembling a cut from If Tomorrow Is A Ball, with how I added the horn sections and little guitar licks. And that ended up fitting perfectly. Also, I added in a melody from a different track called Set, from uh, the Drinking the Sky session, 
uh, hence Aluminum Sunset, and adding on the outro from a track called Step 13 from the Step Session, so Delay of the 13th Frontier, and I thought that outro just kicked ass. <laughs> and speaking of that, I also think that was a good lead-in to 858.2.21.303 Corruption Stairway or Corruption Staircase, as I accidentally submitted to Spotify and iTunes. <laughs> this seems to be the popular pick for best track on the album, uh, and I don't know if it's one of my biggest favorites, but it did get special focus after the 256 Pi Music session called Steps. Like, uh, that session kind of saw me, like, making a collection of disconnected, darker and more experimental cuts, half inspired by some of my Outiker marathoning at the time, and I named every track Step, followed by a number. And that got a way more enthusiastic response than I expected. A bunch of people were, like, talking about how they thought it was my best work to date. And even if I'm not sure I agree, uh, that did result in me incorporating more of that session into the album than I thought I was going to after uploading it. But most notably in this IP address track, which mashed up ideas from, like, six different tracks on that session, especially the four whose numbers form the fake IP address in the title. And for extra flavor, I also sampled a public domain film about rats as test subjects for scientists trying out chemotherapy for the first time. Felt like it totally fit with the music, and the resulting track is probably the edgiest thing I've ever put on any of my albums. But after this early run of tracks, which are all retoolings of tracks from previously released sessions, it's followed by a run of original tracks that were not attached to those sessions. Uh, an unspecified interval of time, that was technically the track that took the longest to make on the album. I had like three different drafts of it over the course of like eight months. And I was particularly proud of how it finally turned out, since it was an FL Studio track that captured some of that more organic-sounding edge that my loop-based stuff has. Really felt like a good demonstration on how far I'd come using that program since the days of Listen to the Headphones. And I had a lot of fun with it, uh, like separating subdivisions at 12 and figuring out how many pulses you could form with that and still make it feel like it naturally fit together as well as including that really badass piano solo that I, I like. I also sampled clock ticking noises from the title screen of Mario and Luigi Partners in Time and some voice snippets from the movie Bullet. Obviously didn't clear any of these samples, but uh, I, I, this album wasn't going to become a hit anyway. I thought this track would make a good teaser single for the album, since it was a pretty epic track that I figured could get people hyped up, but I also wouldn't necessarily be showing off the very best the album had to offer right away. And as well as that track turned out, then there was Noontide, which is probably my favorite track I've ever made with FL Studio to date. It was really difficult to put together, but I was so satisfied with the result. I, I was inspired both by watching a lot of Adam Neely videos, as well as hearing some of Patricia Taxon's recent work like on her Rosa album, to do something that ended up more cerebral and complex like that myself. This track has a weird time signature, it's like 7-4 with a bit of a swing, but I wanted it to still feel natural and not show-offish for its own sake. I gave it a mildly jazzy chord progression that had a more relaxed vibe, despite how weird and IDM-ish the whole thing was in its construction. And I also gave it this crazy, complexro-style drop in the middle section that was so much fun to put together, and yet I don't think interrupted the vibe the rest of the track was creating. I'm really damn proud of it, and uh, it's made me happy to see a lot of other people mark it as one of the big highlights on the album for them, too. But of course, that relaxing vibe is abruptly shattered by 410,757,864,530. Uh, this is a weird track that I got the idea for around the time all the George Floyd protests were breaking out. Even if none of that stuff was going down directly in the area I live in or impacted my life directly, I was still seeing so much of it online and through the news. It was really eye-opening to me on how truly far gone and unfixable our current police system is. So, yeah, I basically intended this track as my own subtle but fairly explicit anti-cop statement. Sort of a similar move to Orbital Framing PHUK as their anti-Brexit statement. 
Like, the track's title came from this old bootleg t-shirt that became a meme years ago that had all these really violent, broken English slogans and ended with a huge and weirdly specific number of dead cops. I mean, not that I promote killing them all 1969, but after seeing police in every major city react to protesters calling for less police violence with even more police violence, and fully proving every point the protesters were trying to make, that shirt kind of ended up becoming a bit of a mood. So I sampled voices saying the numbers on that shirt, followed by pitched up Todd in the Shadows saying dead cops, leading into this hyper chaotic drum and bass segment that sort of fit the mood of what it felt like to watch all of that. Also featuring samples from Zelda CDI saying help, uh, text-to-speech voices saying serving and protecting who, and a snippet from another public domain film that just said the wealthiest man in town because that's who's being served and protected. And even the quieter moments in this track feel pretty tense and chaotic, like that whole jazzy section in the middle that just builds right back up into banging Amen breaks. As if to say, even when you think it's all stopped and quieted down, it hasn't really, it's just now out of your view. I guess I am kind of iffy about the decision to put a track like this on an album mostly about my own ADHD. It doesn't fit into that theme at all. But it does fit into the album half being a reaction to 2020 as a whole, and I didn't want to make this the album's centerpiece or anything because I, I feel that'd just be me trying to make this serious social issue about myself. I don't want to do that. So it's just like this one-off moment that isn't strongly connected with anything else. But I think those two themes of my ADHD and living in 2020 actually come together more in the next leg of the album. There's a run of three beatless tracks that basically symbolize getting totally overwhelmed and burning out. And I structured the album with this section feeling more like the, the most hopeless low point. First, there's what I wouldn't give to have a June with nothing notable happening. One of those tracks uh, where I came up with the title first and sort of built the track around that idea. I came up with it one day when I randomly uh, got the Ulrich Schnauss track Nothing Happens in June stuck in my head. And I mean, I do happen to love that track, but it did really strike me what an unfitting year it was to be thinking about a track called Nothing Happens in June. So I basically made this track as, you know, somewhat of a response to it, and also sort of a spiritual sequel to my old track October Radio a chaotic mishmash sound collage of tons of random samples, but this time actually containing some sort of deeper meaning to me. On top of all the random layers of garbled voices, random abrasive and creepy noises, there's a squeaky synth melody and a yelling vocal chop that have sort of the same melodic shape as uh, the Nothing Happens in June melody, and making it sound totally fucked up. Also containing samples from this one video from the Royal Institution talking about how the boomer generation has systematically cut off opportunities for younger generations to become more successful or live more stable lives for their own personal benefits. Now I might have been counting on the fact that a track like this has no chance of getting popular enough or I might get in trouble from the people I sampled without clearing anything, as is the case with the rest of the album to be honest, but whatever, I still felt like it needed to be here once the idea came into my head. And this track, which is all anxiety, gets followed up by two tracks of personal isolation and burnout. First, there's No One Has Joined Your Call.KME, originally known as Step 5 when I first made it, and receiving an overly melodramatic retitling. Just a spare piano track with bassy pads and rain sound effects, and that intro of someone walking through the rain and failing to call someone. Like right from when I first finished this track, like when working on the original session, I already knew that I didn't really need to change anything. And then it's followed by the somewhat warmer tones of Puzzling Flame, which sort of symbolizes these dark thoughts slowly wearing off and mentally recovering. Also being a mashup of a bunch of ideas from a different 256 Pie Music session I made called Drinking the Sky. That was my first time doing a 100% ambient session, and that was probably the session of music I made in 2020 that I was most overall happy with. I think this track also sort of serves as a cool mirror to Corruption Stairway, how that track also mashed up a whole bunch of already released ideas from one session and got something more complex and dimensional out of it, but near opposite tonally. But then that brings us to the final stretch of the album, the IO series. This set of three tracks was originally based off of the final stretch of the Trilogy of Errors session I already mentioned. I had a three-part track called Intercourse of the Traffic that I was really proud of and knew I wanted to include on um, the album in some capacity pretty much right after I had finished it, but I didn't really think through that crappy title which I got from a random band name generator. 
at first I was going to abbreviate it to IOTT, but then I cut it down to IO, and then connected that to the Jupiter moon, and found a video from the astronomy channel, uh, I think Asterix is what it was called, uh, which talks about IO and its hellish landscape. Which, you know, not a bad metaphor for living in a hell world, and made for some good vocal hooks. Now, the first two parts of this series mostly just followed the original session. Uh, Virus Fluke and the Piccolo, I barely changed it all from its original form since it was pretty much already good the way it was. Carnage of the Pulling Antibodies got a bit of a retooling in its intro since the original cut used a lot of loops that sounded too much like trendy 2016 EDM for my liking, even if I really liked the melodies and didn't want to change those. But actually, of the three parts of the IO series, that's actually my personal favorite. Because it, it just feels like so effortlessly joyous and like a late period peak for the album. Like a momentary full triumph over all the dark thoughts that plagued most of the tracks leading up to it. And on the original session, I had a part three called Departed for Us in 581, which was more chilled out, but I started to feel was a bit too anti-climax after all the great buildup that the first two parts made. So instead of including that on the album, I cut that out and replaced it with a new part four. This original FL Studio cut called Lighting the Trip Fantastic that just goes all out straightforward side trance, and I think that was a much stronger and more satisfying payoff than what I had before. Now, I, I think I saw someone make the connection between this track and uh, the BT track, Tripping the Light Fantastic. Uh, though, believe it or not, that wasn't on purpose. I mean, it's true that it's like the, the name is a flipping around of the phrase Tripping the Light Fantastic, but I first heard that phrase from a, like, a Paul McCartney live album many years ago, and I just thought it sound the switching around sounded cool, I don't know. And it is also true that this track doesn't sound too far off from the BT track. I guess BT's influence runs too deep in my own music where I don't even notice anymore. But when I made this, I was a lot more inspired by, like, Paul Van Dyke and Astral Projection. I was hoping to end up with something that sounded a lot more like those guys. Astral Projection, for instance, have one track I like called Flying Into a Star. And I was inspired by uh, the way they used the titular vocal sample on that track for me to use this one, like, Zelda CDI sample about the stars are made of ice on this one. <laughs> Obviously, the source material makes it more unique to myself, given my upbringing in YTP, but also pitching it down so that the voice actually sounds like a person, I think ended up with a similar sort of effect to the Astral Projection track, and I'm really happy with that. And then that brings us to the final track, The Spherical Discharge, also sort of a mini three-parter with sections called Conical, Cubic, and Coronary. I came up with the full title before I knew what any of that was going to sound like. Now, finishing this album on this much wilder and crazier note was half inspired by 808's Don Solaris and how Banachek was such a badass out of nowhere left hook. It's one of my favorite album endings of all time. Though I don't think the actual effect is even close to the same, just thanks to this one's sequencing. Like, Lighting the Trip Fantastic is not an equivalent to Jerusa Hat because it tonally matches the ending and actually segues into it. But I think this ending certainly works in its own way. It feels like it's going even further with the energy the IO series built up, and even mirroring the opener quite nicely as well with how it ends with all the same mess of experimental synth words and another Wilford Brimley sample. And the three parts of it were made at three totally different times. Uh, Conical is that first, uh, that whole first section with the banging acoustic drums and screeching pads that, like, have the tempo kind of speeding up. That came from a, like, loose, unreleased demo I had lying around that I, I wanted to use somewhere but didn't know where. The second part, Cubic, obviously used to be called Step 85, and is from that session again. And Coronary is just that last little piano solo bit at the end that was fittingly the very last thing I put together for this album. Ending on a note that didn't feel like a full resolution, but at least seemed hopeful and optimistic. Which I guess was just wa uh, the note I wanted 2020 to finish with. And you know, sort of technically did. But yeah, that's every track on here, so I guess here's some closing thoughts. I know this album is not very tight or cohesive, and it does appear to have been met with about as many shrugs as 04 was, and even less attention but I'm all around a lot happier with this than I am with 04. I think it's a lot more authentic to who I am as a person, and I had so much more fun making it, even if it wasn't nearly as high effort as 04. 
it may be cliche to say that it's my favorite album I've made so far, so I'll say it's tied with Marble Jar for that honor. Like, that's an album that really speaks to the kind of person I am and what I like in electronic music or music in general, but in a completely different way. And as for what's going to happen for my next album, that I don't know. I do know that it's going to be different from this one. I may go back towards something shorter and more cohesive, though I have no idea what it'll be like stylistically. And I admittedly have not worked on any new music so far in 2021. I have a feeling a ninth album is not going to be for a few years, if that. But for the time being, this is definitely the kind of project I'm happy to keep at the top of my band camp page for a while and I think could definitely make for a fitting first impression for someone who's never heard my music before. Even if it isn't for everyone, it's a project that left me very personally satisfied and fulfilled, and I think that's probably what's most important.